Over the past two centuries, the San Joaquin Valley has become home to hundreds of distinct cultures originating in nearly every continent. With weather and soil conducive to producing a bounty of crops, the valley lured many farmers across the globe to make the almost mystical trek from their homelands in search of a perfect place to sow their seeds. Our lands have filled with a sensory explosion of colorful languages, magical laughter, and above all, an abundance of flavor utilizing every known seasoning and spice. From the seafaring nation of Portugal, once a part of the ancient Roman Empire, one-time rulers of more than half of the New World and the oldest country in Europe, comes a cuisine that basks in its colonial roots. Small, fiery chilies known as piri piri, black pepper, cinnamon, vanilla, and saffron. Garlic and olive oil are staples as are fresh herbs such as coriander and parsley. From the Azores archipelago, an autonomous region within Portugal, and home to the highest point in all of Portugal, Mount Pico, soaring to nearly 8,000 feet, comes a rich, hearty, and peasant-based style of cooking. Its flavors singing of seafood, spicy stews, sweet desserts, and rich dairy products. And the proudly independent Basque. According to Food & Wine magazine, Basque spend more than twice as much of their disposable income on food as we do in the United States. And they probably spend a greater percentage of their time on cooking and eating too. Portugal, the Azores, and the Basque. A taste of the world right here in our own backyard. Welcome to Dine Out Sabor. The California Health Collaborative is committed to enhancing the quality of life and health for the people of California. The Collaborative implements an array of programs focused on health promotion, disease prevention, and public health surveillance systems. The California Health Collaborative, building partnerships, promoting wellness, and changing lives. The Law Offices of Philip M. Flanagan, specializing in providing guidance and direction in the areas of estate planning, elder law, probate, trust management, and life care planning. Proud supporter of Dine Out Sabor. Visit our website or call for more information. Murata Produce is a proud supporter of local businesses, a family-owned grower, packer, and shipper of cherries, walnuts, onions, and bell peppers. Murata Produce is headquartered in the fertile San Joaquin Valley. Owned by the Fopiana family, their farming traditions date back to the California Gold Rush. Murata Produce proudly supports Dine Out Sabor. Nothing, and I mean nothing, brings family together more than food and drink, Jenny. That's true. Birthdays, holidays, celebrations, everything revolves around and involves eating. Hi, I'm Jennifer Whitney. And I'm Ray Ocanto. Today on Dine Out Sabor, we're going to explore Portuguese and Basque culture right here in the Central Valley. We're here at Ficklin Vineyards in Madeira, and this is the oldest port winery in the entire United States. They've been handcrafting traditional ports using estate-grown Portuguese varietals since their very first crush back in 1948. Yeah, I can't wait. That sounds amazing. And a little bit later, Jennifer is going to meet the owners and the great winemakers of Ficklin Vineyards and taste some delicious port wine. But first, let's talk about food. I recently visited the Shepherd's Inn in downtown Fresno, where for generations, families have been coming together to enjoy traditional Basque cuisine. I'm outside the Shepherd's Inn on Santa Fe Avenue in downtown Fresno. This building, which includes a historic Santa Fe hotel, dates back to the early 1900s. And the Shepherd's Inn is serving up authentic Basque cuisine daily. Let's go check it out. We were inside the Shepherd's Inn in what arguably is one of the most historic cultural restaurants in the Central Valley with owner Russ Stone. Russ, thank you so much for inviting us into this really amazing restaurant. Pleasure to have you. Yeah, tell us a little bit about why your family felt like it's important to maintain the legacy of uh, the Shepherd's Inn and why you keep running it and making it a thriving restaurant here in the Central Valley. 
Well, this business has always been a traditional bash restaurant since 1926. It's located across the rail station, and most bash restaurants are always located directly across the street from the depot. And we're not bashed. We went out and spent a lot of time, found the best bash chef we could, got a bash crew, and we've done everything we can to maintain the bash tradition. So we've been running it for 12. I'm on my 13th year right now. It's more than a restaurant, too. Originally, it was an inn. And tell us about that correlation between building a restaurant, a bass restaurant near a railway station. There's a history and a legacy of why that was done at the beginning of the century, right? Absolutely. Um, bass people were brought in on work visas and the way they traveled, they didn't have cars, they traveled on the rail system. So typically they would travel to the city they wanted to be in and the, across the street was a place that spoke their language, that they were comfortable in and had boarding for them, rooms and boarding and places to eat and drink. So the people would come across the street and when the um, ranchers needed sheep herders, they would come to the hotels, they would recruit the guys, they would take them take them out to a band of sheep and they would take care of them for them. So if I went upstairs right now, what would we see up there? It's, it's more like a hostel setup because it so, was made so in the 20s. So there's going to be, in each room, you have a, a double-sized bed, a sink, a medicine cabinet, a chair, and a dresser. And that's it. Now the bathroom facilities and the shower facilities are common. So there's five of each of those upstairs as well. So Russ, really, what's the condition upstairs? And are people still able to stay there as a hotel? I mean, what are you doing up there? The rooms are maintained, and we remodeled the whole place beautifully as it was in 1926. Mm. We didn't change anything. We didn't update anything. We just kind of cleaned and polished a little bit. The rooms are up there. They are available, but we don't really rent them out just because it was a little overwhelming for us to run both. Basque cuisine is really uniquely different than any kind of cuisine in the world. It's got a little bit of the French influence from mm -hmm. the Pyrenees. It's got that infusion of Spain married together in this sort of culinary uh, extravaganza. What, what, what makes your restaurant so special and what do you pride yourself in the kind of food that you make here? One thing that we really pride ourselves on is all of our steaks and our lamb are cooked perfectly. We're, we're very meticulous about the way we do that. And then you bring in the family style aspect so you can have your full seven course meal. If you leave here hungry, it's your own fault. <laughs> now, we did also change it a little bit. We also call ourselves an American restaurant because the problem we were having is people said it was too much food. But you can also get a three course meal here as well. So then if you don't want to have the huge meal, you can do that. What's so amazing about Basque cuisine, it's got a little bit of the connection to seafood, the mm -hmm. hearty beefs and stews. Um, what is uh, Chef Emmanuel preparing for us today? I mean, he's got to do that big seven course meal. Well, what's, what's he got back there for us? Well, what we made for you guys is one of our house specialties, the coscara, which is a seafood dish with cod, clams, and mussels. Mm. Very good with a light white sauce. Um, and then we focused on the lamb. So we've got some lamb loin chops, some lamb rib chops, which is my favorite. That is the best piece of meat you'll ever taste. Yeah. And one of our aged ribeye steaks. When I think about a, a universal word or language, when I think about Basque cuisine, I think about family. Mm -hmm. Really, the, the meal is served in a family style, the multiple Correct. courses. Tell us a little bit about why it's uniquely different than really kind of any cuisine that you experience here in the Central Valley. It's so much more casual than anything you've ever realized because everyone has to serve the dishes. It's not, you don't have just have your one plate. It's the, all the courses are brought out and everyone shares, so there's a lot of conversation. A lot of things going on at the table as you, as you eat. When people have this amazing meal here and enjoy this wonderful cuisine from Chef Manuel, what's the experience you want the people to have when they, they come here and eat at this really fabulous restaurant? The main thing that we really appreciate about this business is it's not stuffy. We, all the guys, they, I will, all the farmers and ranchers are welcome to come here. We like them when they come in, dusty boots, and it's just a good mix of people. There's a lot, you've got your downtown people, and then you've got your farmers and ranchers that drive for hours, some of them, to come in here and have lunch. We want them to be comfortable and enjoy a good meal. And when they walk out, say that was one of the best steaks that they had. All their food is fantastic. We just, we, we really focus more on the fish than anything else. But today we're going to have the uh, borders table menu, which is a little bit of everything. It's fantastic. The camaraderie, my amigos, uh, old downtown, it's a, a jovial atmosphere, we love it. We're now at the bar here at the Shepherd's Inn, this beautiful, gorgeous, ornate, historic bar that's been around here since the turn of the century with bar manager Giselle Poole. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks yeah. for being here. Yo, thanks for having us. What a beautiful facility, and I, I just look at the historic 
background on this bar that's unique to any bar probably in Fresno or the San Joaquin Valley. Tell us a little bit about what's, what this bar represents here to you. Well, a lot of history. Um, they don't make them like this anymore. This bar has been in this building since 1926 and was originally crafted in Europe. Um, we hear it may have come via San Francisco, but a lot of history. Tell us a little bit about what it's like for you, the experience of being a bar manager downtown, this old historic bar, and the clientele that comes in here that you serve every day. Well, we get a variety of clientele, most definitely. Um, we are here in the agricultural valley, so we get a lot of farmers and, and whatnot, as well as people who work downtown, and then being directly across from the Amtrak station, quite a few people traveling through. You have an amazing selection. Just look right behind us. All these different spirits from bourbon to scotch to you, uh, whiskey, which is uh, probably something you wouldn't think when you walked into a bar here downtown. Well, we definitely pride ourselves on having a wide variety, whether it's wine, spirits, um, craft beers. The Basque people have a tradition, right, with an aperitif, sort of a yes. pre-dinner <laughs> drink, if you will, uh, a little pre-cocktail kind of a thing. Definitely. That is our Pico punch mm. and um, it definitely packs a punch I'd like to make a couple for you yes. and let you try it heck yes absolutely and picon why the name picon what does that mean well picon was the original liquor that they used to make this cocktail with um, out of Europe it's now unavailable in the United States so we use the same type of liquor but it's called Terrania Mare. Terrania Mare. So we start out with just a little splash of grenadine just to sweeten it up a bit. Yeah, just a little bit. Wow, and that looks great. And then from there you take the Terrania Mare, mm -hmm. which is the aperitif or also this is known as an appetizer. Yeah, this is the alcohol part, right? Yes, yeah, one you just of. Keep that like so that. So we've got this almost all the way up here. <laughs> and like I said, it packs a punch. Oh. Then you give it and let me just segue and say it's a it's a very particular order. And you will be corrected if you don't do it. Uh -huh. A little pop of soda. Then you give it a stir. Then you give it a little lemon twist. You're going to rim the glass, drop it in. And from there, you top it off with brandy. It gets mm. a nice, heavy float. Wow. So some folks enjoy sipping that brandy right off the top first, and others will mix it in. You can see why people would like it. You should join me. Here's to you. Here's to you. Thank you, Giselle. The bar's great. You got a great bartender. We like to come here and have a peacock. You know, that's a bass drink. It's very, very good. And uh, drink a little vino, have a good lunch, and go home and go back to work. Wow. Wow, my own? Do we share this? Or is this all me? That's what I said. You leave hungry, it's your own fault. Inside this? <laughs> my gosh, this is incredible. The lamb chop. Mm. Uh, well, I'm Portuguese, of course, and then. Uh, <laughs> And they kind of mimic us real good, so we kind of gravitate towards uh, their, their food. The food at the Shepherd's Inn really was so delicious and so filling, Jenny. You'll have to go there and try it with your family sometime, especially that amazing lamb stew. Oh, I love lamb. I definitely want to check that out. But I also know that you went to Hanford to check out a Portuguese bakery, too. Yeah, yes, Jenny. Equally delicious, too. You know, the Central Valley has a strong Portuguese population. Many work in agriculture, including the dairy industry. And at Hanford Portuguese Bakery, it's located on 10th and Grangeville, they are making this delicious sweet bread. The moment I walked in, I could smell all that tremendous goodness. We're not in the Azores. We're inside the Hanford Portuguese Bakery with my new friend, Osvaldo Lorenco, the owner of the Portuguese Bakery. And you're from Portugal. You were born and raised from Portugal, right? Yeah, I'm born in the Azores, Portugal. I'm born in the islands called Terceira. The moment you walk into this bakery, Osvaldo, the smells permeate everything. It smells so amazing. But you're more than just a bakery. I think if you're Portuguese, you want to come in here because you have a little bit of everything, don't you? We have like a small grocery stores. Things that are yeah, traditional from Portugal. Yeah. Yes, yes. What are your most popular items here at the Hanford Portuguese Bakery? Uh, the sweet bread. Yeah. The sweet bread, uh, um, especially in summertime for the Portuguese celebrations. Uh, we bake for the celebrations between South Santa Maria and uh, all the way north and around uh, here in Kings County. And my bread, uh, we uh, deliver to American supermarkets too. When you think about a bakery, many times they're big commercial operations, but it's just you and Fatima. 
Where are your recipes coming from? Are these passed down from generations? Came from the family. Yes. Like the sweet breads came from my grandmother. And, uh, and a lot of the sweets came from uh, Fatima, my wife. Uh, and also she, uh, she go to the school in Portugal for, for dessert. Yes. Well, it all looks delicious. It all looks amazing. Let's go in and see if we can go try some with, with yeah, Fatima. I know she's making side. something special yeah. for us. Right now it smells good. Yes, yeah, it does. It does. The aromas and scent of this great bakery start right here in the back of the kitchen with Fatima, the wife of Osvaldo, who has been cooking for generations, really. And uh, tell us a little bit about what you're going to make for us today. This is the, the traditional Portuguese sweet bread, which is so famous throughout Central California. And you have a special recipe, right? Yes, it's Ozzy's uh, grandma's recipe. Yeah. Well, yeah. show us your great recipe and how it all comes so together. So we'll start with the eggs okay. and the sugar. 18 yeah. eggs, okay. Uh, maybe a little more. Yeah, and it goes in this I, giant uh, yeah. blender. And then we'll just mix in the flour. That is a lot of flour. How much pounds well, of flour? Well, this is only 15 pounds. 15 pounds? Yes. Oh my gosh. We normally, we did this morning already 75, yes. 75 pounds. This is mashed potatoes. I was just going to say, it looked like the consistency of mashed potatoes. Yeah, it is mashed oh. potatoes. This this is butter, wow. real butter. And yes. this is probably this the most the important yeast. ingredient, right? The, the yeast, yes, which you, gives it the lift and the rise to the bread. If you don't put this in, in here, it won't work, it won't rise. Okay. And that all just comes That's together. It. Now it's just gonna mix. <laughs> and you just scoop it out. Wow. And you put it in here. Wow. From the moment I walked in this bakery, I've had my eye on that tray of everything that has been done and completed. Can we go try some? Sure, <laughs> sure. You're welcome to. This is something really special to you, right? Yes. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about this I one. I invented that cake about five years ago. Oh, look at that. And this is how it looks inside. And what, what, what's inside of it? Tell me what's well, inside it. Well, of course I'm not going to tell you the recipe. Uh -huh. <laughs> and this is a flan. Chocolate right? cake with Yum. a flan on top. Yes. Mm a second and maybe a third bite. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> we should try the your, your this, signature dish, of right? Of course, yeah. Go yeah, ahead. let's try that. Yeah. That is so good in simplicity. Maybe a little butter on it? Yes. Yes. But you could eat that all day long just like yeah. that. That is delicious. Fabulous. Uh, this is a coconut roll. Coconut roll. It's actually just pretty much coconut and butter and sugar and eggs. Mm. It's really good, I think. It's outstanding. <laughs> now, did you put my name on this? Because I'm taking all I of will. these. These are yeah. all going home with me. Okay. That is so delicious. <laughs> thank you. Fatima, thank you and Osvaldo for sharing a, a little taste of Portugal and, and a wonderful divine taste of it. It is. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's our pleasure. The aroma and all that divine sweet goodness, man, I really enjoyed the Hanford Portuguese Bakery, Jenny. Yeah, you pretty much scored on that one. But you know what? I'm pretty lucky, too, because I get to go check out the Ficklin Vineyards yes. right now. So maybe I'll bring you back You better. Class. You better. All right, we'll see. I'm here with Peter Ficklin, who is the senior winemaker and third generation owner and partner of Ficklin Vineyards. And we are so excited to be here. And this is a fantastic building that we're in right now. This is dating back to what, 1940? 1947 when this building went up. It's a pleasure to have you here. Ah, thank you, thank you. So tell me a little bit about the history of the winery. This building was put up in 1947 and all the bricks in this building were, were handmade from local soil. My father went into the uh, University of California Extension Office and got the pamphlet how to make adobe bricks, no. you see. Yes, so the corporation was founded in 1946. The vineyard was planted in 1945. And in 1948 was our first crush of uh, 13 tons of fruit of Portuguese grape varieties off that vineyard. So from 13 tons to what do you do today? We're doing about 100 to 150 tons. Oh. Basically, every year is different. Every sure. year is different, absolutely. And why Portuguese grapes? You know, that's kind of a long convoluted story, but if you think about the history of California wines, it was all fortified dessert wines, muscatels, toques, ports, sauternes, and those kind of things. And in the mid-60s, uh, table wines really became viable out of Napa and the Central Coast and things. And so that segment boomed, and dessert wines and fortified wines have, uh, have kind of diminished ever since. So the family got into this in the late 40s with the intent of making premium Portuguese ports from authentic 
Portuguese grape varieties using time-honored traditional techniques. The wines have been distributed throughout the United States uh, uh, for many, many years. The first wines that we sold were direct to retail. My grandfather handled administration, marketing, and sales, and things like that. My father made the wines. So I kind of stepped into those footsteps, as it were, and we continue to sell wholesale and, and direct to consumers through our tasting room as well. What is it about yours that's different, your ports? What's different is we were the first uh, in the United States to really use Portuguese grape varieties to produce these wines. And we have four varieties that we use, a Tina Madeira, the Tariga, the Tinta Cow, and the Suzao. And each of those, just like Cab, Zin, Merlot, Petite Syrah, and things, has a different set of flavors associated with it. So we're not using Cabernet Sauvignon or Zinfandel, uh, traditional non-port varieties, uh, they're for dry reds and things, but using those authentic grape flavors to structure and blend those wines together to produce the finished product. And so is, does it go in an oak? Barrel or what? Tell me about the barrels and the casks and all that. Well, you know, we've got some redwood tanks behind you here and some oak casks. We've got stainless steel as well in the other building. So the, the grapes that are harvested now, when will that be ready to drink? It will probably be three to four years before it sees a, a, a product such as like the old Vine Tinta going into a blend such as that. If we produce a vintage port, they're bottled within two to two and a half years of making but it, it requires perhaps five to 10 years in that bottle before those flavors start to develop. All right, well, I can't wait to start tasting and seeing everything that's here. Well, we'd love to have you do that. Okay, so now we're in the Adobe room in the wine library and you're going to decant this wine so that we can taste it. Yes, this is a vintage port. It's a 1982. And uh, as these wines accumulate the extended bottle age that gives them the character and the flavor development, um, because they're bottled young, they will uh, drop some sediment and develop a crust in a sense in there. We need a light source because as we, we carefully start to pour, we're view, using the candle to kind of view through the neck of the bottle and pour that clear wine off of the sediment. And so now um, there's a little bit of wine left in here, mm -hmm. but you can kind of see some of the, the crust and things yep. that's, that's in there. And so we have clarified the wine and we can pour a couple of glasses of this wonderful 1982 vintage port. Looks good, all right. That really was unbelievable. And as much as I'd much rather prefer to stay in here the rest of the day, why not? There's how many bottles in here? Not quite a few, let's leave it at that, yeah. <laughs> let's go taste some more in the tasting room. Sounds great. All right. So now we're in the tasting room and I'm with Denise England, who is the general manager of the Eklund Vineyards. And we're going to do a tasting, which is pretty mm -hmm. typical of what someone would experience when they come in to do this, right? Correct. Our tasting room here is open seven days a week, 11 to five. And our selection does change because we have, oh, so many different ports to choose from. But the ones that I would like to present with you today would be ones that are generally available that um, most people would get to taste when they come into our tasting room. Perfect. Let's okay. get started. Great. The first one that I'm going to pour is our Old Vine Tinta. And this is the port that comes from that Solera system. So basically there's a little bit of every harvest in this going all the way back to 1948. So it's our history in a bottle. Amazing. Now, if I were to serve it at home, would I need to let it breathe? No, the Old Vine Tinta um, is so rich and full of the flavor that you're gonna enjoy that from the first sip. Okay, so what else do we have? Um, next, I'd like to pour for you our 10-year Tawny. The Tawny port is one that has spent at least seven years in the barrel. This one's actually spent 10 to 14 in a mini Solera system. Okay, so you can see, tell me the difference. I think this looks a little darker. Exactly. Is that true? Okay. Mm -hmm. The tawnies are going to take on a little bit more of that tawny color. Um, as they sit in those barrels, they caramelize, the sugars caramelize. And so you're going to start picking up more flavors of 
brown sugar and butterscotch. As you said that, that's exactly <laughs> what I was tasting, brown Great. sugar for sure. Um, we also have a series of flavored ports, our passports, and we have a chocolate port. Oh. How do you get chocolate in there? We decided to take uh, our old vine tinta as a base, so it's a quality port, and then as a final step, we've added in um, a small amount of flavoring. And what's really unique about our chocolate port is you start out getting to taste the old vine tinta, and then it builds to a nice dark chocolate on the finish. Oh my gosh. It's so completely different from the other two. Well, Denise, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for coming in. Absolutely. Hey. hey, Jenny. Look what I brought you. Oh my gosh, a cool little Ficklin wine glass. That amazing port wine it's from port. Ficklin. Mm. Oh, that is delicious. Isn't that good? Oh, so good. I know. Great flavor, great notes. Mm. Yeah. We're so lucky. I know. I really enjoyed the whole winery experience and particularly like this vineyard because of the building, in fact, right behind us, the adobe building that dates back to the 1940s. Yeah, it's, you know, it's amazing. There are these uh, great treasures are dotted everywhere in the Central Valley. The mm -hmm. vineyards, the breeze. I mean, you don't think you're in the Central Valley, but we are. That's what makes it so amazing to live here. Absolutely. Yeah. It's right in your own backyard. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us here on Dine Out Sabor as we explored the Basque and Portuguese culture in the Central Valley through food and drink. And to find out more about the places that we've visited or for recipes that you've seen on Dine Out, go to DineOutTV.com. And as always, thank you so much for watching. The California Health Collaborative is committed to enhancing the quality of life and health for the people of California. The Collaborative implements an array of programs focused on health promotion, disease prevention, and public health surveillance systems. The California Health Collaborative, building partnerships, promoting wellness, and changing lives. The Law Offices of Philip M. Flanagan, specializing in providing guidance and direction in the areas of estate planning, elder law, probate, trust management, and life care planning. Proud supporter of Dine Out Sabor. Visit our website or call for more information. Murata Produce is a proud supporter of local businesses, a family-owned grower, packer, and shipper of cherries, walnuts, onions, and bell peppers, Murata Produce is headquartered in the fertile San Joaquin Valley. Owned by the Fopiana family, their farming traditions date back to the California gold rush. Murata Produce proudly supports Dine Out Sabor.